That was wonderful. We need another ice cream cone whenever you can have it. But it was a fantastic panel, and it was really exciting to be able to listen to you all. But you want big data and AI? We're going to give them to you. No worries. So uh, here I am again, Paola. But I would like also to introduce my great friend and great curator and writer and partner in crime, Alice Rothstorn, here. <laughs> And um, I'm going to sit down with her, and we've decided to, you know, we kind of like not really to play games, but just to make things a little interesting for everyone and for ourselves. And we decided to look at all the trends that WGSN has identified for the report today, and to pick f four trends that were already discussed here today, and four that were not discussed, and choose one slide for each, and then riff on them, and try to see if we can bring everything together uh, without making a summation of the day, but rather reflecting upon it. But first, I would like to introduce Alice to you a little better. I'm sure that all of you here know of her and know her already. She's a great writer and a very fine thinker about design. Her career is really long and has gone through journalism, writing books, and also having the best Instagram feed about design that is available on Instagram. So um, the way she thinks about design is always very inventive and creative and always really analytical and really cuts across history and across disciplines. So it's no wonder that we really like to work together and to think about design together and we complement each other often. So that said, um, you know, we can start. You have the power, right? Yes, good. So you have the okay. power there and we can get running into our slideshow. Please, Alice. Okay. Well, thank you, Paula. I feel doomed to disappoint after that wonderful <laughs> introduction, but thank you all the same. And just for John, we're going to start with lots of data and AI. This um, is a very luxurious product. It, um, the theme that I'm going to address by talking about it is um, Luke's for less. Um, because I think it sums it up and then takes it forward very neatly. It is the SNU, it's called a smart crib, and it was designed by Fuse Project in San Francisco, together with a leading US pediatrician, Dr. Harvey Karp. Um, as I said, it is a luxury product. It costs over $1,000, which I'd say is a luxurious price, definitely not a minimal one. And if you look at it, it sums up a traditional notion of Luke's for less very deftly, because it, it, certainly in terms of its styling and aesthetics, it's sleek, it's simple, there's no Black Panther cubs crawling across it, or Cinderella sparkling glitter and tinsel everywhere. It's very elegant exercise in visual design restraint. It is also an example of Luke's for less in terms of its functionality, because I think currently, if we're talking about minimal luxury, it's impossible not to think of the way that tiny, minuscule digital devices pack more power than great big bulldozers. And as we've been told by the director of um, The First Man, the new Neil Armstrong movie, um, the power that we have in an average smartphone is now greater computer power than the whole of NASA had when they went to the moon. That may be a slight exaggeration, but only a slight one. Because this seemingly mundane crib is packed with technology. It's full of sensors, robotics, and other artificial intelligence systems, because as a smart crib, it automatically cuddles the baby, rocks the crib, varies the speed and vigor of the rocking. Um, it swaddles the baby if it feels like it, because the sensors detect the baby's mood and respond to it automatically. Another benefit, as you'll see, the baby is in a kind of harness, and that very sensibly is intended to stop it from rolling over and suffering cot death. So the argument is, if you spend over $1,000 on a snoo, your baby will be happier and healthier because it will have higher quality sleep, and the parents are likely to be happier and healthier too because they'll be less sleep deprived and won't be stressed out about the risk of cot death all the time. Well, so far so good, you may think. 
But where I think this product is really interesting actually doesn't concern the physicality of the product. It doesn't concern its functionality. It's the moral debate that it has engendered. And I think this is going to be one of the key impacts of artificial intelligence and the other neuromorphic and quantum computing systems that are coming our way and reinventing the products like a baby's crib that we use every day. Now, when the SNU was launched, I posted about it in a very neutral way on my Instagram account, simply describing what it was, and the response was staggering. Some people thought it was the best thing they'd ever seen and said they only wished they'd had it when their child was born. Others described it as evil. Someone described it as child abuse, and there was a massive and ferocious discussion in minuscule little comments as to whether this really was the best thing in progressive child rearing or actually an evil plan to encourage sloppy parenting, uh, the argument being that a machine, even a digital one, couldn't possibly match human care. So I believe that as artificial intelligence and robotics and other forms moves into more and more functional aspects of our lives, one of the fascinating outcomes will be that we'll really have to drill down to the morality of how we use technology, what its implications will be, and design will be absolutely essential to that process. Yay, well done. I'll, I'll need the next one. No, no, the okay. next slide. Thank you so much. This, indeed, that was looks for less, and now we move on to biofactoring, also biofabrication, depending on biodesign, however you want to discuss it. And we have talked about it a lot this morning. We've had a wonderful panel. And we've seen there are many different ways to biofabricate. There's biofabrication with biological materials. There's biofabrication of biological materials, and then there's biofabrication with biological materials, and that's the one that I would like to talk about today. We have been trying to imitate nature for centuries, for millennia. We've been trying to imitate its forms, the way it builds, its structure, because nature does it best. It designs best, it builds best, it, it destroys best, it eats up best, it's cruel and creative and generous at the same time. And for centuries we've been imitating structure and form. Lately, with the advent of digital technology, we've been able to get closer also to the way intrinsically it is able to grow. But the most beautiful advancement, in my opinion, which is an advancement, or if you wish, also a way to look backwards, is the idea of co-design and co-creation. Co-creation with nature. And today I showed you a very quick image of the pavilion, the silk pavilion that Neri Oxman and the Mediated Matter Group created for the MIT Media Lab atrium. Well, what they did is they studied the behavior of silkworms. They studied by putting them in little plexiglass cubes and putting sensors, once again data mining, and once again artificial intelligence, or at least gathering of data and computing them. They looked at how silkworms behave with certain conditions of temperature and light. They also put little trees in squares and looked at the height of these little trees, these little poles at the center of the squares, and they discovered that up to a certain height, the silkworm would build a little tent, but if the height was too much, they would build flat. So really interestingly, they studied in detail how silkworms weave their silk thread and how they behave. And then on the basis of the study, they created the optimal conditions for thousands of silkworms to build an architecture such as this pavilion. What they did is they fabricated digitally uh, a kind of scaffolding for the silkworms to act on and then many, one after the other, they positioned the silkworms over the scaffolding. Usually in the silk industries, silkworms are killed uh, right after they have delivered their silk thread, and in this case, they were left to die spontaneously. And now, the interesting thing is that this is about building with nature. There's nothing better if we want to grow objects and grow buildings as opposed to designing them from the top down than letting nature run its course and working with it. As you've seen today, there are many other natural elements that we can 
build and design with. Today, Maurizio Montalti talked about the mushroom mycelium, and you've seen how beautifully it fills structures and how beautifully it engulfs fibers, of whether they are corn stalks or other. You're seeing here how, how silkworms weave their thread. There's bees that are also amongst the heroes of today's design and also architecture, not to mention algae, which you've also seen, and also many other uh, great and important substances and beings that are studied a lot by architects and designers these days. But this idea of building with nature and designing with nature might be the most promising way to biofabricate in the future. And presumably we're going to see much more of that in your Broken Nature yes. show here at the Triennale. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, well, following on very neatly from Nipper and John, um, my next theme is New Majorities, um, which of course syncs um, very neatly with the idea of new consumer voices. And I have interpreted New Majorities to mean the sort of explosion of activity in the definition of personal identity and the emergence of so many more groups of people with very different, constantly changing identities, all of which are of great importance to them. So design, in terms of the challenges and opportunities it faces, clearly needs to get to grips with a much more nuanced understanding of far subtler definitions of gender, of geography, of ethnicity, of uh, ability and so-called disability, of the political causes and environmental causes that people espouse, all the sort of signifiers that people use to define themselves. Um, also, if the design community is to do this, it needs to change. I mean, as Nipper alluded to, design is certainly at the highest, most powerful levels, is still too cis male and it's too white and too Western. And when people flick through the design history books of the future, looking back at our time and the period that's to come, I very much hope that that will have changed because it needs to. Um, so the design community needs to become more diverse and inclusive in terms of who are designers, but also much more open-minded. And again, Nipper and John both touched on this in terms of the curiosity and empathy that's meted out to the design cultures in different countries, different geographies, different parts of the world. And so rather than simply seeing globalization as an excuse for invasion and profiteering, the design community increasingly, as many members of it already do and have always done, needs to see it as a source of inquiry, experimentation, and exploration. And one of the most interesting exercises in this that I've come across is this. It's the tulip pyramid, this weird object on the screen, or objects. And it was the graduation project of a Chinese designer, Jing He, um, when she graduated from Design Academy Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Jing was born and brought up in China, but then studied in the Netherlands, where she still lives for eight years. And her objective for her graduation project was to try and identify what is the design identity of contemporary China. Uh, obviously a country that went through years of the Cultural Revolution and is now gradually putting much more political and economic capital and cultural capital in design. And so Jing conducted a research exercise into this and concluded that a defining element of China's design identity throughout the centuries was copying, not in the Western sense of theft, piracy, and negativity, but in a much more creative, generous, respectful, and empathic sense. Um, she decided to explore this further by exploring the history of the tulip pyramid. And these were the incredible sort of porcelain towers literally made to display tulips by Dutch porcelain manufacturers in the early 1700s. And they were inspired by a painting by a Dutch explorer of a porcelain clad tower in Nanjing in China. So in other words, they were a direct copy and were then copied in China. Based on her research, um, she sent it to five Chinese designers of around her own age. They were in their mid to late 20s, but working in very different disciplines, and asked them each to design two layers of the tulip pyramid 
on the left. And this was based not only on her research, but the group exchange on WeChat, which is a Chinese um, chat app. Um, she also designed a tulip pyramid of her own, and that's the one on the right. And in it, she identified what she considered to be the most iconographic examples of recent Dutch design. So you'll see um, work by Marcel Wanders, Heli Ongirius, and others there. And both pyramids were 3D printed. So the result I find completely compelling. It puts copying in a completely different light that helps us to understand the emerging Chinese design sensibility, not completely obviously, but at least to overcome one of the cliches that we in the West hold. And also, I think formally, these objects are absolutely incredible because they're neurotic, they're hysterical, they're frenzied, and yet there's a formal logic to them. She has a phenomenal sense of proportion, and because they were 3D printed, not in whole, but in part, they have taken this sort of eerily neurotic, futuristic, fractured shape that is impossible to achieve by any, any other means. So I think they tell us a great deal about the form of objects now and in the near future, as well as Chinese design. That was so good, and it's interesting because Alice mentioned both new majorities and empathy, and in a way it flows really seamlessly into the next slide, even though this slide might seem completely different. It is not. There's a, a humane charge, there's emotion, and there's love in the slide as there was in the one before. And you know, since Alice and I were playing the game of what the trend names inspire does with. I'm showing here not design, but art. And uh, that comes as a surprise, because I usually never use art as an example, because I think that design needs to be propaganda banded around the world as the most important discipline. But when I saw these images by photographer Laura Aguilar, I was bowled over. Empathy, the future is emotions, is the trend that inspired me to choose Laura. And the emotion um, is love and empathy. In the current situation of the world, where so much hatred is exploding every day, everywhere, the reaction for a so-called normal citizen, whatever normal means, can be one of two. Either you go in the direction of hatred or you go in the direction of love of, and empathy. Of course, there's more in the spectrum, but right now for drama, I'm gonna bifurcate the path that one can take. I choose love and empathy as I think most designers do. Laura Aguilar, a photographer, Chicana photographer from Los Angeles. Chicana means Mexican-American, uh, gay and queer, and uh, um, wonderfully loving of every other human being herself, has been, uh, had taken all these self-portraits of her own body in, uh, in, in the context of nature and in conversation with nature. When I saw them the first time, I was, as I told you, bowled over, and I really wanted to meet her because she spoke to all the uh, aspects that I would like designers to cover. She spoke of diversity, and she spoke of loving diverse and loving other people. She spoke of celebrating herself and one's vulnerability. And so I reached out and tried to find her, and she had just passed away she, at age 56. And um, I will I'll forever have this longing of having met her just to know more about what she thought when she took all these pictures. But I really do believe that if the future is about emotions, it's not going to be just about emotions grabbing uh, buyers and customers in stores. It's also going to be emotions to bypass the uh, absurd babble tower of faiths and beliefs and, uh, uh, and partisanships that exist in the world today. Designers can use emotions to bypass all that and to really get to the point and maybe find commonalities and help people find commonalities. Today, Cicel talked about the power of the senses that we have left unexplored, and of course, of fact is one, but the other is this kind of amazing images that get to the core cuore, get to the heart of the matter at hand. 
So Laura, to me, is the embodiment of this idea of the future being emotions and the future relying on empathy and on trust of other human beings. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to move on to an object that I believe espouses many of those fine qualities. And the theme I'm going to address is in touch, but I've been cheeky because I haven't interpreted it in the way that WGS ended in terms of interconnectivity, which is obviously a hugely important aspect of contemporary design, but in terms of the sensation of touch. So I was, of course, thrilled when Cecil um, spoke so eloquently and beautiful about smell, which I think, like touch, has been absurdly marginalized in design for centuries. Now, touch really is fledgling, not only in design, but elsewhere, for the simple reason that our understanding of it is so limited. There have been, in the last 50 years, um, 50 times more scientific papers written about the science of vision than the science of touch. So even scientists don't understand it, certainly not to the same degree. Um, we all recognize touch instinctively if something is hot, cold, wet, dry, um, coarse, shiny, smooth, harsh, sharp, whatever. You immediately recognize that feeling, but we have a very limited vocabulary, just as we do with smell, as Cecil pointed out, to describe those sensations, rooted, of course, partly in this dearth of scientific inquiry, but that is changing because in the last 10 years, more scientific papers have been published on touch than in the preceding century. And hopefully this will continue. And I believe that touch in terms of the desirability of objects, particularly luxury objects, but all other objects too, including affordable ones, will be more and more important to design in future. Um, and this is partly because, of course, um, operating touch screens has encouraged us to use touch in a much more delicate and also functional way, whether we're stroking the screen, prodding it, skimming across it, or whatever. And at the same time, our exposure to digital technology has made us crave the raw, the spontaneous, the natural, the authentic, which the physical sensation of touching something absolutely helps us to realize. So my example is this simple wooden stool, um, the Georg, which was designed by a Swedish-Danish designer, Chris Lilienberg Hellstrom for Skagerrak, the Danish furniture maker. And judged on old-fashioned design criteria, it's a fine thing. It's beautifully fabricated by Skagerrak. The materials are very deftly chosen. It's robust. It fulfills its function perfectly. It's comfortable to sit on, and it's likely to last for a long time. And it has won shoals of design awards, including a Red Dot Award in Germany. It's also sold very well, but what many of the people who assessed it for those awards and indeed have bought it may not realize is there's a very sophisticated political subtext to this seemingly simple stool because Chris is interested in interrogating, first of all, gender stereotyping and in industrial design, but in defining new approaches to design that will enable us to embrace the new era of gender queering and gender fluidity by enabling enabling people to project their own nuanced sense of their gender identities onto different objects. And the Georg is a case in point. Chris deliberately adopted a very unobtrusive aesthetic, avoiding bold colors, jazzy graphic patterns, and relying on texture, the glossiness and sheen of the wood, and a really wonderful texture, very sophisticated and complex texture, of the cushion. Because of the way the structure of the Georg, when you approach it, you naturally want to plump up the cushion to suit yourself and your body shape. And so that immediately not only makes you feel that you're somehow personalizing the object in a very modest way, but you also immediately experience the texture of the fabric and then contrast it to the sheen of the wood, which is a very delightful experience. So I think with this seemingly mundane, if certainly um, very appealing object, 
Chris has managed to say something very sophisticated and important about the future role of touch in design, because Chris believes that touch hasn't been gendered yet for the simple reason that we know so little about it. So it isn't prey to the stereotypes of gender, ethnicity, ability, disability, whatever, that is rife in so many other areas of product and furniture design. And if Chris is right, and I believe that they are, then touch is a wonderful example, as is smell, for designers to work with new media and define them for a new future which is fairer, more open-minded, more fluid, and more egalitarian. Yay, way to go. Thank you. I'm going to move to the next one. Wonderful. The next is a, another form of design that we haven't really talked about today. It's a manga comic from Japan. It is by Masayuki Ishikawa, and it's Moya Simon. It's the story of a little boy that can see and communicate with bacteria. So the, the, the comics are really wonderful. Moya Simon goes around the world, and he sees a whole population that we can never see. He sees bacteria everywhere, and he's friendly with them. They're all different bacteria that talk to him, that have conversations, and uh, that, that they are his friends. Now, it's interesting because I remember growing up, and probably Alice, you too, um, not being particularly clean. I mean, yes, clean, but not um, obsessively so. My parents would let me play on the ground, and sometimes I would do terrible things and put things in my mouth, you know, just, I don't know. I think that my microbiome was quite healthy. And I'm talking here about the trend of improbable collaborations. This morning, we talked about working with bacteria, Natsei Chiesa showed us how she actually paints fabrics with bacteria, and we talked about the fact that bacteria can, we didn't talk about the fact that bacteria can also eat plastic and dissolve plastic. Bacteria can do a lot, and they are ideal partners, but they are also partners of the world and partners in cities. The scale of bacteria life is incredibly vast. There are actually uh, urban planners that are studying the microbiome, not of human beings, but of subway stations. There's a whole map of bi microbiomes of all the subway stations in the New York subway system, and so on and so forth. And I'm sure that when Cicel was gathering the scent of different parts of cities, she was also giving a good thought and possibly gathering also the bacteria. This whole world that we cannot see is a world that we can design with and that we can design for. And that is one of the directions that so many architects and designers are taking. Improbable collaborations are not only with other specialists or other human beings or animals, they are at all scales. There are collaborations that can be had with minerals. Of course, they need to be animated in a different way. There are collaborations that can be had also with plants. And in fact, uh, here, at the Triennale in March, we will have a whole section that is going to be about the nation of plants. We're going to consider it a national participation of the same ilk of Germany or uh, the UK or Sri Lanka if the coup d'etat lets them have, give us the pavilion. But the nation of plants will have its own constitution and will be a role model for other nations. It's the work of Stefano Mancuso, who is a scientist, Italian scientist that emigrated a few years ago, that has been studying plants' behavior and plants' life for a really long time. So the fact that design can be expanded to include all these different partners is something that designers will have to reckon with in the future and will have to be inspired by. Well, thank you, and I look forward to the nation of plants. Having learned this week there are more trees in Britain than people. <laughs> if only they'd voted against Brexit, but never mind. Um, right, well, my fourth and final choice of theme um, is about positive discomfort. And luckily, given that Andrea and Simone of Studio Forma Fantasma spoke so beautifully about the environmental and ethical responsibilities of design with reference to digital and electronic waste and recycling earlier, 
I have chosen uh, to look at positive discomfort not in the sense of ethical and environmental responsibility, but in the sense that all of us are becoming increasingly quirky, contrarian, counterintuitive, and that this is having a profound impact on many areas of design. And as my example, I have picked something so familiar it's seemingly mundane, and indeed lots of people, admittedly rather foolishly, don't believe it's been designed at all, and that is traffic management and road signs. And um, throughout the industrial era, from the industrial revolution onwards, as transportation increased, the need to regulate all these moving trains, ships, and vehicles increased too. And throughout the 20th century, in particular the second half of the 20th century, as cars became affordable for so many people in so many countries, though obviously not all, this arsenal of regulations expanded even further and of course was manifested on our streets in the form of road signs. And some of the finest examples of modernist design are the road signage systems, like the wonderful one that Jock Calvert, uh, um, sorry, Jock Kinnear and Margaret Calvert designed in the UK. Conservative, though British public sector design is in so many respects. This is a gem we can really be proud of, their road and motorway signage system. But recent research has suggested that the 20th century notion that if you put up signs, it will A, reassure people that the roads are being properly managed, and B, people will pay attention to them and act upon them, and therefore drive more safely and responsibly with greater care for other road users, is beginning to change. And um, the pioneer of this was a Dutch civil engineer and um, traffic planner called Hans Modermann. And he was absolutely obsessed with the design of traffic management and traffic signage systems. And I have a great weakness for design obsessives, as I know Paula does. There is something wonderful about people who are so passionate about one particular sphere, they educate themselves in it rigorously, and really treat their work as a crusade to implement it to the best of their ability. And Hans Modermann trained as an advanced driving instructor, and indeed practiced as one, and also as an accident investigator. He was so determined to really have the fullest possible understanding of the implications of traffic management. And his conclusion was that rather than encouraging people to drive more cautiously and responsibly, road signs and any sort of form of traffic controls were having the opposite effect because he felt that we'd become too blasé about them, we were taking them for granted, or we rather foolishly assumed that all other road users were paying attention to them, therefore we didn't need to. And um, the statistics seem to bear this out because this is one of the prototypes that he developed in the Netherlands as um, what he would call a, sh a naked street bereft of traffic signals or a shared space where pedestrians, a cyclist and a car would move together and negotiate their own spaces. And it has been found that when these shared spaces and naked streets are introduced, there are fewer accidents, there's less congestion, and the length of time it takes to drive from A to B, or indeed walk or cycle from A to B, is shorter because journeys are speeded up. Similarly, there's evidence to suggest that traffic lights tend to cause accidents rather than restrain them because people are so focused on the lights, they don't pay attention to what other road users are doing. And this is why the incidence of accidents at traffic lights is so very high. And I believe that this sort of contrariness, the counterintuition from becoming so familiar with 20th century industrial age design tropes that they just no longer work for us anymore is evident in more and more areas of activity and fields of behavior and is something that designers in their roles as amateur psychologists are going to have to contend with in years to come. And for my own personal experience of naked streets, there is one street 
in London that's a naked street, and it's Exhibition Road, which runs to the west of the Victoria and Albert Museum. And all I can say is that whenever I drive up or down it on my way to the v &A, I always drive more cautiously and safely because I am so befuddled by the lack of road signs, I need to focus on the road. Very true. It's like one of the most puzzling streets in all of London, it's true. My final choice for today is Alexandra Frustolfer, Transitory Yarn. Alexandra is a young Austrian designer, and she designed this as almost a performance, as a best metaphor for circularity. We are all having trouble with the uh, environmental tr problems that we have caused. And of course, one of the biggest problems is this uh, enormous amount of waste that, of course, Simone and Andrea have taught us can be considered a new material, but nonetheless, in some cases, it remains waste and it gets unloaded onto countries that are less fortunate or less, fortunate or less able to protect themselves from our onslaught of trash. Well, uh, one of the most important uh, issues that we need to teach uh, our public people as critics, as designers, as curators, is that we don't live in a linear uh, and simple world, that we're living in systems, systems that are complex and that have many points of entries and many points of pressure, just like the acupuncture scheme of the body, of the human body. So if uh, a building falls in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and kills more than 1,300 sweatshop workers, the right reaction is not to stop buying clothes made in Bangladesh. Uh, the right reaction is to see where we can act as citizens in order to uh, kind of push the system in a different, more holistic and wholesome direction. Similarly, our problem with fashion is not that there's too much work put in fashion, but rather that there's too much material and too much energy and too much of a footprint that gets moved into fashion. If we could maintain the workforce by making it so that every fabric and every material can be reused in a different garment, we would maintain the workforce in action, but we would be able also to be less heavy on the world. So, in other words, it's about common sense, and common sense comes from thinking before acting. And circularity is probably one of the best trends that we want to push for as citizens. Once again, the power is not only in designers' hands, it's also in citizens' hands. And I think that the co-creation and the collaboration between designers and the people that will work uh, for them, that will buy their products or that will give them feedback is the most promising of all. And um, I was thinking, this is something of a surprise, but um, without putting you on the spotlight, but just to celebrate you again, would Andrea Bell and Lisa White from WGSN join us on stage for a moment? Because you have, you know, it's like, sorry to put you on the spot like this, but it would be wonderful if you could give us your feedback um, after the whole day and after you've heard Alice and me speak about it. Maybe you want to just tell us what you think, your reaction as respondents to this final session on your work. I think one that I found particularly interesting was the in touch, and that's something we've been tracking at WGSN is the lack of, <clears throat> excuse me, touch in our daily lives, there was a study that came out this year that said um, the average person over 55 goes five days without touching another person now in the US. Um, and there's many factors behind it. One, we're relying on technology to, um, no surprise in the US, we're having a little issue with inappropriate touch lately. So I think there's a lot of deterrence to it. But I think if we start to lose the physical touch, whether we're touching clothing or a reassuring touch with a colleague or a friend, um, that impacts everything we do in our senses. So for me, when, when you came to that one, I was like, yes, perfect. Oh, it was yours? Yeah. I really love this because, believe it or not, we're talking about things that are immaterial, but I really love objects. I am somebody who is just a big fan of a water bottle, a table, a shoe. But what I found was really interesting about all of these um, presentations together, and I kept noting that, noticing this, and we've been talking about it at WGSN for a while, 
And it's about systems, not stuff. And again, it's really all the systems that are in place, the multi-layered systems that are happening here. If it's AI, if it's human beings, and all of this coexisting together, it's very complex but very beautiful. And that is getting back to what Anipa said as well too. In the end, it's really all about beauty. Um, I wanted to pick up on the notion of touch because I, the SNU, the object that I began with, the smart robotic AI at Ridden Crib, um, I think one of the reasons it's so contentious is that it says quite implicitly but openly that the human touch isn't always necessarily best. Now, many people object to that. There can be, and they have a perfect entitlement to do so. Um, and there can be many reasons for that. A parent could be ill, they could be extremely tired, parents thought they could be drunk, and they're in charge of an infant. It's very interesting that when people analyze driverless cars, they always talk about the risk of drunken drivers. I've yet to see anyone suggest a parent could be drunk in charge of a baby, but presumably they are from time to time. And so I think that what so many of these highly advanced digital products and services do is really make us question the limits of human capacity and human tolerance and human potential, which absolutely goes to your notion of appropriate touch. Time's up, thank goodness, for the inappropriate variety. And there's an onus not just on designers, but on all of us to make sure that human touch is more present, but only in appropriate ways. Thank you. It seems to me that today there were some concepts that were crystal clear and some others that have revealed themselves interestingly slippery. And one of the most slippery has been the concept of looks and luxury. It's fascinating because we are speaking to an audience that has been gathered here by the Association of Luxury Industries in Italy. So um, I, I don't think there's any answer here, but I urge you all to think about what luxury means to you and what it'll mean in the future. But did you gather anything interesting for your research about luxury in the future today? I mean, I think there was many facets that I found really interesting. One of the ones that came out is the concept of luxury and ownership, I think, came up quite a bit. And we know that Gen Z, um, they don't value product the same way. They don't want to own product the same way. They're very, um, they're digital, they're a digital cohort, meaning that they don't, um, that they don't want anything tangible. In the US, it's particularly affecting a lot of markets for driving resale, there's an app for all the luxury people in the room, your, some of your products are probably being sold on it, so I would flag that up. It's called Depop, D-E-P-O-P. -E An item is sold on Depop by teens in the US every four seconds. It has four million teens and counting, reselling your luxury goods. So I think the idea of craftsmanship and luxury, what does that mean? New materials and luxury really embedding meaning and feeling into a luxury product as it opposed to an aesthetic will continue to shift the design world. And again, oh, too, the whole idea about um, less, and getting back to that very first uh, topic that we presented, it's taking things away until you're at the very core of something. If that's beauty, if it's quality, um, it maybe is for a very high price point or a low price point, but the word less, I think, is going to be very important, economically speaking, but then also aesthetically. Just one more thing I would like to really press is the idea of who your future, I won't use the word consumer, who your future customer is and think about that. I think we use a lot of dated segmentations and I think true luxury brands really need to focus on who will be buying them within five to 10 years, what are their needs and their priorities and how to speak to them in an authentic way. I would say I would really stress that for everyone in the room. Anything you want to add? Um, well, actually, I would love to hear your, both of your thoughts on what is design's role in that process. Will it continue to be used by the luxury industry in the traditional way? Or do you feel that, in other words, with quite a formal, stylistic product and product development focus, or do you feel that design will play the more sort of eclectic and expansive role that it's increasingly playing in services, whether it's healthcare, social services, or whatever? 
I feel very much that it's going to be both, and that's maybe because um, I like to be generous with things, but I really think that design has both roles. It's got the role um, about creating those systems that are going to be put into place to make sure things are sustainable and ethical and responsible, but then also making very, very beautiful things to, to the point of, uh, you know, like Philippe Stark, I still remember the first time, because I, I took political science and I came into design very late, and I arrived in Paris, I was in, in my early 20s, and I encountered his toothbrush, and that blew my mind that actually you could have an everyday object as a toothbrush that would be like a sculpture and it was a little piece of luxury in my bathroom every day. Still the idea of creating something that's very beautiful and that is an actual product is something very inspiring too. Thank you very much also the two unaware, the two unaware participants in this panel. Thank you, Alice. This Thank was you, fun as ever. And, uh, uh, Thank you all, and I'm going to call here, who's going to come? Stefania Lazzaroni, the general manager of Alta Gamma, to say goodbye. <laughs> There's a forest of the <laughs> Thank you. Really, uh, there's not much to say. It was really fascinating, especially this last conversation, I believe, if you share my thoughts has been really pulling together all the threads of the day. It was like a field rouge, and you really have summarized everything, and it was really beautifully done. So thank you very much. Thank you to Paola, again, our you know, amazing curator behind the scenes. Thank you to all the moderators, to Tony Chambers, and to Anya, and to all the speakers. It has been an incredibly intense and fascinating day. I'm sure that all the ideas, you know, that have come up were really quite interesting for me and I hope, I really hope, also for everybody here. Our primary, our primary objective was really to create an opportunity to share, to, you know, to share insights and also to go out of our comfort zones. We've been, you know, we've been jumping, you know, uh, on the future, and in a way we, we're, we're trying to glimpse this new future, a future where the technosphere is a reality, a future where diversity and biodiversity is really a given, and where sharing and being open is a must. But before closing the day, which for me has been an amazing day, I have to say also a few thanks to all our media partners, media partners that have been with us the full day. Thank you very much for sharing the first edition of Next Design Perspective. I have to thank Next Design, that Next Design, um, sorry, Nascent Design, who has pulled up all the creative and the identity of this, uh, uh, of this event. Thank you very much for all the effort. And I have to thank uh, really all the people that have cooperated for this first edition, and especially Alta Gamma team, who really pulled it through. In spite of it all, thanks, thanks to Elena, Eduardo, Sonia, and Ilaria, and everybody. All I want to say is I really hope to see you here next year. And in the meantime, please follow us on the social media. We will give you more information about the next edition. And uh, I really hope you're going to be here with us again next year. Thank you so much. Bye.